Well, today we are continuing in this series that we've been in now for about the last month called Jesus, the Crucified King. And for those of you who are new, this is a series about the life and teaching of Jesus as seen through the eyes of one of the leaders of the early movement of Jesus. His name is Mark. Uh, He's a close personal friend of the apostle Peter. And so he writes an account of the life and teaching of Jesus based on the firsthand uh, experiences of Peter. And so this last month, we've watched as Jesus has come to the, for the last time to the city of Jerusalem. It's, uh, it's Passover week. The city is crabbed with pilgrims. It's the last week of his life. And, and every day during this week, he's beginning to reveal in some new and provocative, very bold, but also some subtle ways who he truly is. He's beginning to reveal his true identity as the, the true king of Israel, the, the Messiah. And so uh, on Sunday we watch as he comes into uh, Jerusalem. He's riding on the colt of a donkey in fulfillment of this ancient prophecy in Zechariah that when the king comes, he'll come riding on the colt of a donkey. Then on Monday, he, he kind of busts his way into the huge temple complex. He overturns the tables of the vendors, the money changers, in fulfillment of a prophecy of Malachi that one way Yahweh will come to the nation. And when Yahweh comes, he will come to the temple to begin to cleanse the nation. And so uh, it's, it's as if it's with every passing day, Jesus is like a card player that's kind of laying down the next card in his hand, revealing more and more of who he is and why he's come. And of course, this is leading uh, to increasing, escalating uh, conflict with the religious leaders, the political leaders of the day, the, the two are the same, uh, who are, see him as a threat to their authority and their influence. And so uh, what we saw the last time we were together in, in Mark chapter uh, 11, was that what's happening, it's still early in the week. It's like Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. Uh, Every day, Jesus is coming into the temple courts in the morning, and he teaches in the morning, Uh, teaches all day. And then in the afternoon, he leaves, end of the day, leaves, he goes back to uh, outside the city of Jerusalem to the little town of Bethany, just two miles to the east. And so so every day he's coming and teaching. What we saw last time is that uh, on on probably Tuesday, uh, he came in and he's, he's greeted. By, these, uh, by a delegation. And what's gonna happen in this, this week is that the religious leaders, political leaders, they're looking for a way to bring him down. They're looking for a way to undercut his growing popularity with the crowds or a way to bring him up on charges for the Roman officials. And so what's happening is they're sending delegations, uh, one right after another, of different uh, kind of groups, uh, 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 alliances of political leaders, religious leaders. It's Herodians one day, it's Pharisees, it's Sadducees, it's chief priests, it's elders. Uh, it's different groups. And they're coming in, and we want to picture this like a press conference, like a hostile uh, press conference, where you have a, a, like a political candidate or a government official that's, that something's going on, and this, this press corps is trying to, to lob questions that are like bombs, uh, kind of trying to get him to say something that will undercut uh, his credibility or, or to cause him to bring up on charges. And so last time we, we saw him answer their first charge about where do you th- who do you think you are, where did you get this authority to do what you're doing? Well, today Jesus is going to go on the offensive. And today he's going to make his own charges against the religious leaders of the nation, that they are ruining the nation, they're leading the nation away from God, they've rejected God's leadership, and therefore they are going to be destroyed. But Jesus is going to do this in a veiled way. He's going to do this in a very, uh, a, a way that would never hold up in court. And the way he's going to do this is he's going to tell a story, a short story, what we call a parable. But to understand that parable, we have to understand a parable from the Old Testament that the prophet Isaiah told. So, so the people there listening to him, they had all grown up with the story of Isaiah. Uh, it was one of their bedtime stories. They, they, all the people know this. We don't know this. And to understand the story Jesus is going to tell today, we have to understand the backstory. And so there on your note sheet, there's a section called God's Vineyard, the backstory. And what I'd like you to do is turn with me to the book of uh, Isaiah in the Old Testament, the middle of your Old Testament. Uh, if you've got your app, go ahead and turn there. We're going we're to go to uh, chapter five of, uh, of Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter five, uh, let me set it up. This is about 700 years before Jesus, maybe 750 years before Jesus. Uh, the nation of Israel had a long history of rebellion against God. And so over the years, God would send prophets, uh, messengers, to call them back to him. 
And uh, Isaiah was one of these prophets. He's one of the most famous of these prophets. Uh, and so uh, the prophets would often use very creative ways to communicate their message. It wasn't like they would always just stand up and give a, a message like I'm giving today. Sometimes they do that. Often they would use poetry. They would use metaphors. They would use word pictures. Uh, sometimes they would even dramatize, kind of act out a message. And so in this, uh, in this story, what we need, to, we need to picture is we need to picture kind of the nation of Israel listening to Isaiah. Maybe he's at the temple. Uh, and he's telling this story, right? And he's got to tell a story. It's about a man in his vineyard. And so here we go. Chapter 5 of Isaiah and verse 1. So Isaiah says, I will sing for the one I love. I will sing a song about his vineyard. And so, so Isaiah is kind of speaking here for the nation. He's singing a song about this landlord and about his vineyard. And he says, my loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside, and he dug it up, and he cleared it of stones, and he planted it with the choicest of vines. Okay, so now, so now we need to kind of follow this. Uh, I want you to picture Napa Valley. All right, how many have been to Napa Valley? Okay, great. I, I got to go there for the first time in September. Uh, this, if you've never been to an incredible place, just all these beautiful vineyards, right? And there's a passion. There's a passion for wine in, in Napa Valley. And so uh, Isaiah says, hey, let me tell you a story. He says, let me tell you a story. It's about a man in his vineyard. And as we unpack this story, what we're going to see is that this, is, uh, this vineyard is not just an economic uh, project for this man. It's a, it's, it's a project of love. This is a man, probably a wealthy man, who uh, loves wine, uh, loves fine wine. He wants to create a beautiful vineyard uh, that will produce great grapes and great wine that are going to be a blessing to the world, so to speak, right? And so, so this guy's going to go out, and he's going to scope it out. He's going to hire a real estate agent. He's going to go out and find just perfect land that's very fertile soil. Uh, and then he's going to do everything that he can to make this vineyard thrive. And so he's going, to, not only, he's, going to buy this, he's going to buy the land, he's going to import the vines. He's going to put up a wall and hedge to protect it from intruders and wild animals. He's going to build a watchtower that can kind of guard it from anyone coming to try to steal it. Uh, he's going to build a wine press. You can just process the wine right there. And he's got this vision, right? So what I want you to catch, this, this is a vision of love. This is a man who loves the vineyard. And he, it's more than economic. It's, it's a passion for him. Right? He's, a, he's a wine lover. He has a passion for wine. So the story starts out that he buys this land. He starts preparing it. Verse 2, he digs it up, clears his stones, plays, plants it with the choice of vines, and he builds a watchtower in it to protect it, and he, he cuts out a wine press, processes the grapes, and then he looks for a crop of good grapes, but, here comes the big but, but it yielded only what? Bad fruit. Can we say it again? Yielded what? Bad fruit. So I want you to picture this. Isaiah's telling us the Cliff Notes version of the story. We're talking years here. You've scoped out the land. You've heavily invested financially. You've imported the finest of vines. You've worked out your irrigation. You've built the wall to protect it, a watchtower, built a wine press. You have invested heavily. And you are so excited for those first season of grapes, right? And the first season comes and the, the vines aren't really that mature yet. So just, you know, not that many grapes, but they're kind of sour. You are know, like, whoa, what's going on here? And you begin to fertilize it some more and anything else they could do. And it goes on to year two and year three and year four. And you've done everything you can to produce a thriving vineyard. But it's just, it's just kind of, it's just beyond conception. It's just like, these, it's like sour grapes. And so you bring your buddies, you bring your consultant. Is there anything else they could do? Can you think of it? Well, well where'd you, how's all this great land, this fertile soil? Where'd you get your vines? Wait, we got the, the vines, we got, here's how we brought that in. You know, well, how are you irrigating? How are you fertilizing it? You know, it's, are, are you guarding? Is you making sure no one's coming in, polluting it, putting salt in or something like that? No, we got, we got the watchtower in place. I've done everything I can. Like, I don't know what to do for this vineyard. Right? So that's the scenario. And so in verse 3, now, of course, remember, picture yourself. You're there in Isaiah's day, and you are telling the story. And they're all listening in. And they're just listening to the story. And they're, and they're just thinking like, yeah, this is crazy. I've never heard a story like this. crazy story. When you, when you, you know, you get good land and you invest in it and you bring in the great vine and you take care of it. It's like, this should be thriving. This is weird. This is mysterious. But in the crowd, that's where you're at, right? The emotional, that's where you're at. 
And so he, he, he talks to the crowd. He says, now, you dwellers in Jerusalem, you men of Judah, the southern nation, I want you to judge between me and my vineyard. Why don't you weigh in on this? What do you think? He says, what more could I have done for my vineyard that, that I've done for? I mean, is there anything you could think of? Like, what do you think we should do? And they're like, crazy. He said, but I look for good grapes and it only yielded bad. And she says, so here's what I'm going to do. What, I, what I'm going to do with my vineyard is I, I'm going to take away its hedge. I'm going to, and it will be destroyed. I'll break down its wall. It'll be trampled. I'm going to make it a wasteland, neither pruned or cultivated. Briars and thorns will grow there. In other words, I'm going to bring in a bulldozer. And I've invested years in time and energy. And no matter what we've done, best consultants, we cannot turn this thing around. It's just sour grapes. We're just going to level this place, take it back to the way it was. So it's so disappointed. And so he says, verse six, I'll make it into a wasteland, neither pruned or cultivated. Briars and thorns will grow up. I'm gonna command the clouds not to rain. I'm gonna curse this land. And so if you're there in the crowd, you're thinking, yeah, good call. This is stupid. This is ridiculous. Who's ever heard? I've never heard of something like this. Yeah, flatten it, right? And now comes the punchline. He says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. And remember, Lord, all caps. What does that mean? Yahweh. Yahweh. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of whom? Israel. Israel. All of a sudden, Isaiah stops. He says, okay, you got the story? Yeah, you follow the story? Yep. You get while he destroyed it? Yep, we get it. It's a crazy story. Okay, you are the vineyard. You're the nation that God has loved dearly, invested in, given you everything to succeed, and you've only produced rotten fruit. And he said, and and the men of Judah are the garden of his what? Delight. And here's what I I want to just, this is a love story. This is not just a financial venture. He loves this garden. He has done everything to make it thrive. It just hasn't worked. And so he goes on and he says, uh, and he looked, the, the landowner, God looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, he heard cries of distress. So in context, what he's talking about, if you were to read the first four chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah brings his charge against the nation. They've rebelled against God. He used to be their first love. They've rebelled against him. They've run after other lovers, after other idols. And because their relationship with God has broken down, their relationship horizontally with one another has broken down. Their society has become full of violence. It's become full of oppression of the poor. The judges are taking bribes. Injustice is ruling. The nation is coming apart at the seams because they've rejected their God. So that's the backstory for our story today. So now let's go to the next section. It says God's vineyard, the next chapter. Okay, so let's set the stage, chapter 12 of Mark. Set the stage, remember Jesus in the temple every day teaching. Last time we saw him, he was answering the question, who gave you the authority to do this? He had silenced that question, answered that. And so now he's beginning to go on the offensive. And he says, he began to speak to them in parables, short stories. And here he goes, first story. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press, and he built a watchtower. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> this is a story they grew up on. This is a story they all knew. And, and as, he, as he starts a story, they know exactly who the characters of the story are. To them, this is a story of Israel in rebellion in the time of Isaiah the prophet. This is a st- the story of a rebellious nation that led to its destruction and exile in Babylon. This is a story of a people that refused to listen to God and the bad fruit, the society that was torn apart. They know this story. They know who the landowner is, they know who the vineyard is. But Jesus is gonna do something very interesting. He's gonna take this ancient story and he's gonna write a sequel. He's going to add the next chapter. And in this chapter, there's a third set of characters. 
in the first story, there was only two characters, the vineyard and the landowner. Now we're going to add a third set of characters, and that's the farmers. And in, this, uh, in Jesus' day, the way it worked is that often uh, far, uh, landowners would, uh, rich, wealthy landowners would buy up large tracts of land, and then they would lease it out to tenant farmers who would raise crops on that land, and then they would pay back at harvest time part a percentage of the crops as their, as their rent. And so Jesus is going to build on that. And so again, remember, they're in the, so they know, they know at the beginning, they know who the, they, they're going to know who, who the landowner is, they know who the vineyard are, but Jesus is introducing something new that they're going to have to figure out. And so he says, uh, so he rented, uh, the middle of verse uh, one, so he rented the vineyard to some farmers, and then he went away on a journey. And this is very typical. This would happen in their, their land all the time. So at harvest time, he sends a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. It's standard operating procedure. But they seize him, and they beat him, and they send him away empty-handed. So the question is, how will the owner at distance respond to this? Well, he sends... Uh, verse, verse, uh, verse four, he sent another servant. Now, which number is this? Number two, okay, servant number two. He sent servant number two to them, and they struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. So violence is escalating, all right? And so the, man, the, the owner says he still sent, he, he st- he sent still another. This is, uh, this is messenger what? Number three. His name is Joe and he did not want to go. <laughs> like at this point, they, no one's volunteering for this, right? And it's a good thing they didn't volunteer because he said he sent, he sent another, and that one they what? They killed. So violence is escalating. And so he sent many others, four, five, six, seven, eight. We don't know how many, but he sent many others, and it just all went the same. Some they beat, others they killed. And so at this point, the landowner makes a strategic decision. Uh, and he makes it for a couple reasons. First of all, he's run out of messengers. Uh, secondly, though, he, his, his logic goes like this. Hey, listen, I know they've, they've blown off all these messengers. I know they beat some, they've killed others. He says, but, uh, you know, I'm gonna, this time I'm going to send my son. I, I love my son. They know how I love my son. I'm going to send my son, and, and, and they're going to be too stupid. I mean, they, they know you don't mess with my son, Right? the tenant farmers are going to see it differently. They're going to look at it like this. I can't believe how spineless this guy is. This is unbelievable. He sent seven, eight, nine, we've killed some, we've beat him up, we've told him forget it, probably flipped him off basically, and he's done nothing. And so, so when, when the sun comes on the scene, their logic is, hey, let's just kill him. Let's take it over. He, he doesn't have the backbone. He doesn't have the will to do anything about this. And so, in verse 6, it says, he had one left to send, a son whom he loved, and he sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him. The inheritance will be ours. So they took him, they killed him, they threw him out of the vineyard, his own vineyard, throw him out. And so Jesus asked this rhetorical question, much like Isaiah had asked his rhetorical question, what more could I have done for my field, for, uh, for the vineyard? Jesus asked this question, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? And I want you to catch this. If you were there and you weren't brought up in a Christian home or you never read this passage before and we weren't like inoculated against the word of God, I think if you were there in the crowd that day, there would be definite different opinions here. Like, I, I think that there would be many that would say, I don't think he's going to do anything. He's been wimpy. He's shown a lack of initiative, a lack of nerve. This is the stupidest story. Who could ever imagine someone putting up with that much abuse, rejecting his servants? Like, he should have come after day one. If he hasn't come after seven, eight, or nine, he's killed many, then there's no way he's going to do anything. He's all talk. He's all bluff. He's going to make threats. He's never going to come. I think there are many in the crowd that are going, that's what's going to happen. Then I'm sure there's others that are like, hey, you don't mess with a man's son. He may have let the servants go, but you mess with his son, he's going to come, he's come loaded for bear. And so Jesus says, well, let me tell you the answer. So in verse, uh, verse 9, he says, he will come and he will kill those tenants and he will give the vineyard to others. Scorched earth. He's coming, he's going to wipe them out. 
and then he's going to rent out his vineyard to some new people who will take better care of it. And then Jesus now begins to land the plane. Up to this point in time, uh, they've known who, the, uh, who the, the landowner is. They know who the vineyard is. But they don't really know who the, the farmers are. The key to the story. And so now Jesus is going to begin to land the plane. He's going to reveal. And he says in verse 10, haven't you read this scripture? And he's going to quote from Psalm 118. And Psalm 118 was a very famous psalm. In fact, we saw it just a few weeks ago. Remember the very first day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the colt? The crowds were there, and, and they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who, what? Comes in the name of the Lord. That is a quote from Psalm 118 a messianic psalm. And so Jesus says, I, I know you think you have this worked out, how the, how the king's gonna come, but there's more to that story. And he says, the stone, he, he quotes from this verse, he says, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, the cornerstone, the most important stone in the building. And he says, the Lord, Yahweh has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And so if you were to go back and study the context of Psalm 118, Psalm 118 is, is a time in Israel's history where God was raising up a leader to be king of the nation. And the leaders of the nation who are portrayed as builders, like builders of the, the building, like the nation of Israel is like a building, they're building it. The leaders, the builders of the nation rejected that leader. But later on, through a turn, turn of events, God put that leader and made him king. And so the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And this becomes one of the most famous verses in the New Testament, it becomes one of the most quoted verses in all the New Testament to help explain how when Messiah came, he was rejected by Israel. The, the stone that was the cornerstone was rejected. And so at this point, the leaders now are beginning to understand what the story's about. The, the nation of Israel, the, the vineyard is the nation of Israel. The landlord is uh, God, the farmers are the leaders of the nation who are rejecting God's rule. And throughout Israel's history, he has sent prophets, messengers to him time and time again. By and large, the nation has not responded well. They've mocked, they've beat up, they've arrested, and they've killed. And what Jesus is saying is this generation is just like Isaiah's generation. And this generation is is just like the leaders of Isaiah's generation. And you are gonna reject the ultimate messenger, the son. And as a result, judgment is coming on you. But Jesus has made this accusation in a way that will not stand up in court, in a way that allows for plausible deniability. But they know exactly what he's saying. And so if you look at verse 12, it says they looked, talking about these leaders, they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he'd spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of whom? The crowd. Remember, the crowd, his popularity is rising. Last thing they want is revolt, uh, a, a, a riot during Passover season when the place was, was booked. Uh, they said so, so they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and they went away but kind of mark my words, remember what I said that first week of this series, from the moment that Jesus rode the colt down the hill, the Mount of Olives, uh, it was like a fuse was lit. And every day it's, it's burning brighter and faster towards its inevitable end, this explosion that's gonna happen Thursday night. When the leaders catch this, they're not gonna arrest Jesus during the day while he's teaching for fear of the crowds. They're gonna wait till the middle of the night and they're gonna go where he's been betrayed, the Garden of Gethsemane. They're gonna arrest him in the middle of the night. They're gonna run him through a mock trial against the law, by the way, in the middle of the night. Bring him up on charges of blasphemy, which is the death penalty for Jews. Present him to Pilate, the Roman governor, on charges of high treason against Caesar for claiming to be king. And by nine o'clock in the morning, he's gonna be on the cross while the rest of the city is waking up. They're dealing with this before the crowds can get involved. Are you with me in this? You following me? And so that's where the story is going. 
But today, what I want to do is take some time and unpack this story uh, of the vineyards, these two vineyards, because there's a couple high-level principles for our lives, what it looks like to follow Jesus, what it means to, to, to walk with God, and then there's a couple uh, pointed questions, kind of penetrating questions I want to ask at the end to really land the plane for our lives. And so there on your note sheet, there's a section called the vineyard, uh, two core concepts, and uh, I want to start with these two high-level principles uh, and then come back and apply them, and so here we go. Number one, the first lesson of the vineyard is that God's love runs deep. Uh, God, God's love for us uh, as people, it runs very deep. And this is something that's both uh, kind of obvious and, and sort of not so obvious in these two parables. But here's what I want to say. The story of Israel, and we often talk about this here at Rocky Peak, but the story of Israel is really all of our stories. You know, sometimes you look at them and say, why were they so blind or why were they so rebellious? But the reality is, the story of Israel is all of our stories. It's just a case study of the human race. It's like what happens when you take a group of people, God reveals himself as the one who loves him, offers to enter into a relationship, to love, to bless, protect. What happens? Well, it's going to go bad. That's what's going to go happen. Their story is our story. And so what you see today is uh, this, this uh, story of Israel is at its core is a love story. And I want you to think about this. Uh, Nation of Israel, they're in slavery in Egypt, right? God comes and rescues them, brings them to Mount Sinai three months later. They come there, God reveals himself, and God says to them, I love you. I want to be your God. You will be my people. And he he offers them, it's basically a proposal. It's like a a wedding proposal, right? And so he, I will love you. I'll protect you. I'll bless you. We'll enter into a relationship. Uh, You will love me. Follow me. We will have eyes for no one else, right? And so the prophets often compare it to a wedding ceremony. And so, so God expresses his love. And of course, Israel is like a young woman who's been a damsel in distress, who's been uh, rescued from a, a horrible enemy, from slavery. And she loves this new God who's just loved her, led her through the wilderness, rescued her, given her new life. And so Israel's all in. They're like a young woman in love. Like, absolutely, I, I want that relationship. But as you study their, their history as it plays out, Israel is like a young wife that soon after their wedding day begins to have affairs. And it's not, it's not just one affair, it's just like serial affairs. And so she's running after uh, one lover after another. And, and so God is showing, his, he continues the, uh, to run after her, continues to pursue her, continues to invite her back in relationship, offers to forgive her, to cleanse her. And she continues to uh, put him off, continue to kind of give him the finger, uh, well, you know, F you, whatever. It's just, she, it's, it's rough language, but it's very like biblical prophetic language. That she's like, no, I'm going to sleep under every tree with whoever I want. That's Jeremiah. I'm going to commit lewd acts with whoever I want. I, I, I'm going to run. And so, so the story of Israel is a story of this amazing love uh, that's rejected. And so you see this in the prophets. For example, there, today we looked at Isaiah, but there in your note sheet I put a, uh, uh, from Jeremiah chapter 2. Where Jeremiah says, I I remember the devotion of your youth. God is speaking. And God's saying to Israel, he says, I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride, you love me. And you follow me through the desert. You follow me to Sinai, through a land not sown. He says, I remember our early days. I remember the love. I remember those first few nights together. I I remember the passion. I remember the romance. I remember how it was and, and how I loved you. And I loved you. And this is forever. He says, I remember those days and they burn in my heart. But you're like a nation that's run after other lovers. You run after other gods. You've looked for answers in life from other things other than our relationship. And you see that love today being played out in both of these parables. You see it in Isaiah 5. There in your note sheet. Look how it starts off. Remember how it started off? Uh, Isaiah is speaking. It's representing the nation. He says, I will sing for the one I, what? I love. It, it, speaking as the bride, speaking as picturing the bride, you know, speaking for the bride, he says, I will sing for the one I love, about, a song about his vineyard. My what? My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He goes on to talk about how, how this loved one had done everything he could to provide so that this, this Israel could thrive, his bride could thrive, and yet she throws it in his face, she rejects him, she runs after other lovers. And so then God says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty, Yahweh Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his what? 
Like, this is not a financial venture for him. This is a passion. He, he del- this landowner delights in his vineyard and his wine and this vision is like a young man delighting over his wife, his bride. And yet she's rejected him time and time again. And then you see this love. You see this love in Jesus' parable. Because in Jesus' parable, it's not as obvious, but I want you to go back in time and hear it as they would have heard it. This is an outrageous story. They already know who the vineyard was. The the vineyard is the garden of his delight. It's Israel. They already know who the landowner is. It's God. It's a story. It's a love story. It's Jesus is writing the next chapter. And it's a crazy chapter. It's a chapter about him sending messengers time and time again, beating some, mocking others, arresting others. They know exactly what he's talking about. And I'm telling you, if you heard this story for the first time, I got to take off our, our kind of uh, Christianese glasses. Take off our glasses of familiarity. And read this story. And honestly, if you're there, if I'm there, I'm going, this is crazy. Like if I'm there and Jesus is telling the story, I'm saying after the first messenger is beaten up, I'm going in. You mess with him, you mess with me. He's my personal envoy. He's like an ambassador. Like if I don't deal with this, they're going to go farther. If I was telling the story, it'd be like, then they beat him up and they sent away empty-handed and say, and then the landowner came and killed him. You got a Mike's version. That's why I'm not the Messiah. Um, uh, and so as you're there, it's like, I, if I'm in the crowd, I'm getting irritated. I'm like, are you serious? What kind of leader is this? This landowner, he's got no backbone. He's got no spine. He's like, he doesn't understand how lights work. This is ridiculous. Six, seven, Eight, killing your people till you run out of prophets? You run out of messengers? Like, what kind of story is this? This is like the lamest landowner in the history of the world. And then all of a sudden, you find out that the landowner isn't weak. It's not that he lacks will. This is a landowner that's passionate about his vineyard. And he waits because he loves. His love runs deep. That's why he didn't go and wipe them out. Because he just kept hoping one more, one more, one more, loving on them, coming back, leave your lovers. This was the story of their history. The story of Israel is a love story. You know, I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. I know some of you did, some of you didn't. There, there's advantages both ways. I think there's tremendous advantages growing up in a Christian home, but there's disadvantages too. And one of the disadvantages of growing up in a Christian home is that you take for granted the obvious. Like sometimes you're so familiar with the story of the Bible, you miss the obvious. You've read the story so many times, you're so familiar, you think you understand it when you don't. It's one of the great disadvantages. One of the things that you take advantage of the most is often is God's love. Because from the time you were this high, the first thing you're taught is God loves you, right? First thing you're taught. And so you just kind of take it for granted. You miss the obvious. Can I tell you, for me, as I grew up, it wasn't until I began to read the Old Testament, not the New Testament, the Old Testament, and especially the prophets, that I began to understand the love of God. Because it's in the Old Testament testament this case story of the human race that you see this nation spits in god's face when he comes after flips him off goes and blatantly commits adultery under every spreading tree and a god who refuses to write him off who continues to love that i could relate to you see this is the love that god has it's a love that runs deep It's the message of both these parables. Second message. The second message is sort of the flip side. And it goes like this, that there's a limit to our rebellion. What 
What what you see in both these parables is that there's a limit to our rebellion. God's incredibly patient. His love runs deep. But there comes a point where we have gone too far. And I want to be clear on this, what I mean and what I don't mean. What I don't mean is that there comes a point where you've gone so far that God says, forget it, I'm done with you. Uh, Even if you turn around and come back, I don't want you. I'm not saying that. Because what we know from the parables, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how far you've run for God, it doesn't matter how you've rejected him in your life, it doesn't make any difference. If you want to come home, his love runs deep and he's going to bring you back. But here's what I want you to come, uh, catch. And so there comes a point in our life, every time we rebel against the love of God, every time we resist the message that he's sending us or his messengers, that something happens to our heart. Our heart becomes harder. Think of this practically. Uh, the man that you know, goes out and has an affair, the, or the woman that goes out, let's stick with that since that's the parable. The woman that goes out and has an affair the first time feels bad about it, right? The second time she feels less bad. The third time she feels less bad. What, what's happening? Her heart is becoming hard. And this is what happens when we rebel against God's love in our life. Our heart becomes harder and we can get to the place Where it's not that God won't take us back, we don't want to come back. There's a limit to our rebellion. And you see that here in both of these parables. This this, uh, landowner in Isaiah 5, he has provided everything the people that, that Israel needs to thrive. He loves them. He's given the choicest of vines, built the wall, built the hedge, watchtower goes up, wine press goes down, irrigation, protection. He's done everything he can so they can thrive. But there comes a point after a certain amount of years, all the consultants, everything he's done, to, is there anything else I can do? And the answer is no. You have done everything you can. And as the nation continues to, to rebel, there comes a time when the bulldozer came in. And in 586 BC, the time had come, the nation was destroyed, sent into exile. And Jesus' parable, God's love runs deep, messenger after messenger, just doesn't even make any sense because of his great love. But Jesus warns these leaders, you are about to go too far. You are about to kill the final messenger of the Son. And if your hearts are that hard, there's no hope for you. Judgment will come. Are are you with me here? There comes a point we resist the love of God for so long that there's nothing left for judgment. And so God's love runs deep, but there's a limit to our rebellion. So let's take these two principles you see all through the Bible, these two twin principles, and let's talk about our lives. And I have two questions for you. They're on your note sheet. There's a section called the vineyard, two, two quick questions, two uh, key questions. First of all, the first question I have for you is what kind of fruit are you bearing? So we are here, the body of Christ. We're, we're Christ followers for most of us. Some of you are just checking it out. It's awesome, we're glad to hear you. Most of us here, we're, we're, we're Christ followers. We've given our life to Jesus. And, and here's the thing, what we learn in the Bible is that, that we are now God's vineyard. We'll talk about this more later. As a follower of Jesus, you're now his vineyard. And and when you come to Jesus, he provides everything you need to bear good fruit and to thrive in your life. He he provides everything you need to thrive in your marriage, to thrive uh, in your parenting, to thrive uh, in your uh, finances, to thrive in your workplace, to thrive in your ministry, uh, to thrive in your impact and your legacy. That when you come to Jesus, just like the landowner gave the vineyard everything they needed to thrive, the, the, the vines, the walls, the watchtower, the, that the same way that God gives you everything you need to thrive. That when you come to Jesus, first of all, he gives you the gift of forgiveness, a brand new start, so that your past doesn't have to control your future. And then on top of that, he gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit, who comes to lead us, guide us, empower us to live a whole new life. And then on top of that, he gives us his word, which is his path to life, right? One of my favorite verses, Psalm 119.32, the psalmist says, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Remember, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you 
phrase. So he gives us his word, this roadmap. Here, here's life. Here's how to live life. And then he gives us the body of Christ. And so we're in relationship. We have brothers and sisters who love us, challenge, encourage, support, come around side. Like when you come to Jesus, he gives you everything you need to thrive. In fact, this week in your life group homework, we're going to look at a verse in 2 Peter chapter 1 where it says that, that through Christ, we've been given everything we need for a life of godliness. The moment you come to Jesus, everything you need to thrive. So the question is, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Are you thriving? It's really interesting. In John chapter 15, Jesus adds the third chapter of the story of the vineyard. A lot of you are familiar with this, but you've never put this together. But, you know, chapter one, the first part of the, first, first part of the, the story is Isaiah 5, the story of the vineyard, right? Second chapter, Jesus rewrites, adds a, adds a chapter. It's the story of the leaders of the vineyard. But in John chapter 15, he adds a third and final chapter of this vineyard story. A lot of you are familiar with the story. You're familiar with the verbiage, the story, the parable, but you're, you're perhaps never put together like this. But I want you to think with me. In John chapter 15, last night, Jesus was with his men, so two days earlier, maybe three days earlier, he's told the story of the vineyard and the leaders. Now he gets the third, the third story. A couple days later, it's last night, Thursday night, late, maybe Friday morning early. He's talking with his men. He's about to be executed. He's going to be arrested that night. And he says some of these famous words. He says, I am the vine. And you are what? The branches. It's a parable of the vineyard. You as my people are the new vineyard of God. You're the new Israel. You're my people. I am the true vine, and you're the vineyard. He says, and here is my desire for your life. He says a few verses later. I'm not gonna, we're not going to open it up. You'll, you'll study it in your life group this week, but just going to kind of walk you through it. A few verses later, he says that my goal is for you to bear much fruit, to thrive. And he said, and the key to you bearing much fruit, the key is staying connected to me. He says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, you stay connected to me, you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. It's a promise. You'll thrive. Right? And so how do we stay connected? Well, a few verses later, verse 11, Jesus says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. The love of God runs deep. So on that, you'll remain. You'll stay connected. Still the same, same analogy. And he says, and then here's what's going to happen. He says that my joy will be experienced in your life. And he said, your joy will be made full, complete, over, 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 overflowing. So catch this. So here's the sequence. Here's the progression. I'm the vine. You are the branch. I want you to be fruitful and thrive. The key to thriving is staying connected. This key to, to stay, the key to staying connected is obeying my commands. And the end result is you're going to thrive and you're going to experience my joy. Do you see how that works? And so Jesus kind of rounds out the story of the vineyard. You're my vineyard. So the question again, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Are you thriving? You know, I was thinking about this week. I was thinking about how uh, when it comes to following Jesus, over the course of my life, I've met two different kinds of people. Think of it as a spectrum uh, with one on one in each, each side. Two different kinds of people that claim to be Christ followers. Uh, I don't know if they are Christ followers or not. Uh, you know, sometimes people claim to be Christ followers, and I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing the fruit, but that's kind of between them and God, right? That's not my job. Figure that out. That's between them, them and God. I really feel called in my life to shepherd people who want to grow. Like, if you don't want to grow... If you're going life to see how far away from Jesus can I get, you know, and still not be judged, it's like, that's eh, between you and God. I'm not even interested. I want to work with people who are passionate about being all they could be. I want to work with people who really want to grow and live life like it's supposed to be lived, that they want to experience all that. That's my calling. It's my calling. It's my passion, right? And so, so whether these, they are Christ followers or not Christ followers, there's two kinds of people that call themselves Christ followers, right? And on this end of the spectrum, you have a group of people that self-identify as a Christ follower, but honestly, uh, there's not much fruit going on in their life. Their life's kind of a mess, right? And, 
And so they're, they're, um, they're, just, they're, they're not growing, they're not changing, they're not transforming, they're not loving people, uh, they're, they're no passion for God, no passion for things of God. It's just now we have, and it seems like their question in life is how far from the vine can I get without being cut off? You remember back like in uh, junior high, high school, college, some of you are dating now asking this question. Do you remember like when it comes to sexual purity issues, do you remember asking that question, how far can I go and it still be okay? That, that's really the wrong question. The right question is what can I do in our sexual relationships as we're dating, what can I do that, to handle this area of my life so that we can thrive? That's the right question. And in life, if you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. And so this kind of a Christian, they kind of approach their whole spiritual life like this. How close can I get to the line and not fall off the edge? How far from Jesus can I get and not get come under judgment and not get burned, right? Uh, uh, how much disobedience can I, I have and still be okay? And as a result, their life is a mess. They're, not, they're like Israel. Their lives are a mess. They're not growing. They're not changing. Their marriages are a mess. Their, their uh, spiritual life is a mess. Their character is a mess. Uh, their, their jobs are often a mess. Just, they're just they're asking the wrong question. And then there's another kind of person, and they're asking a very different question. They're on the other end of the spectrum. And this kind of person, they really believe Jesus. They don't just believe certain things about Jesus, about the cross and salvation and how to become saved. It's not just believe, they believe Jesus. There's a difference. They, they, believe, they believe that the love of Jesus runs deep. They believe that he has their best interest in mind always. They believe if he says no on some issue or yes on some issue, it's always protective, it's never restrictive. They believe Jesus. They believe he is bigger and brighter and smarter than they are. They believe Jesus. And so when it comes to their life, the question isn't how far can I get from Jesus and not be cut off and shriveled up? The question is not how little fruit can I, I produce and still be okay. Their question is how close to the vine can I get? Their question is I, I want to thrive. I want to bear fruit in my marriage. I want to bear fruit in my family. I, I want to grow and thrive and live life as it's meant to be lived. I want to use my gifts and I want to have an impact on the world. I want to make a difference. I want to leave a legacy. I want to live a life well lived. And so how close to Jesus can I get? Right? Like is, is there anything in my life, Lord, that needs to be pruned? Because Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. My father is the gardener. He prunes every branch so we can bear more fruit. So there, there, there is just, is, Father, is there anything in my life that you need to prune away that's, that's causing me not to thrive and produce fruit? I, I love you. I trust you. I know your love runs deep. You are the son who came to die for me. If you died for me, then why wouldn't you live for me? I need you. I trust you. I believe you. And so if there's any area of my life that's screwed up, messed up, that you need to prune, that you need to speak to me about, speak into my life, Father, because I want to thrive. Right? And here's a question. Which person are you more like? Because probably most of us be somewhere in the middle. So, so are you more like this person? How far can I get? How, how much can I resist the love of God and still be in his kingdom? Or are you more like this person? Say, bring it on. I want the full dose. I totally believe you. I know you love me. I know you're smart, way smarter than me. And even the hard things, you speak the truth, I'll follow because I'm in for everything. I want to live a fruitful life. Second question. I just want to go faster. The second question is, are you rebelling against God's love? All we see in this passage is possible, in both these passages, it's possible 
that though God's love runs deep, to run against him so hard, resist his messengers for so long that our hearts become hard and we don't even want to come home. We're like, like Israel. We've rejected for so long so many different lovers. We, we've hard, we, we don't want to be rescued. We don't want to be saved. We don't want to be healed. We want to do our own thing. And so God sends us messengers time and time again throughout our life. And we've just gotten the place where we just kill them, ignore them, lock them up, uh, deny that they ever came, and we just resist the message of God's love to us. And so what we don't really, we, we think that we'll always go on. We don't think there'll be a day of reckoning. But what we've seen in both these parables is there's a limit to our rebellion. There comes a point where we have resisted for so long, God says, you know, there's no hope for this field. There's nothing else I can do. There's nothing else I can say. All that's left is judgment. And you know what? We saw it in the first two parables, but it's also in the third parable, the vine and the branches. Because here's what Jesus says. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, I'll remain in you, you'll bear much fruit. He said, if you don't remain in me, you will dry up. You won't bear fruit. You'll be cut off, thrown in a pile, and burned. The picture of judgment. This message from Isaiah to Jesus on Tuesday to Jesus on Thursday, completely consistent all the way through. And and so sometimes we think we can play fast and loose with God and resist his voice and remain unchanged. We can't. You resist long enough, you will get to the place where you won't even believe in this God anymore, let alone return. And when that happens, there's no more hope. You've been cut off. And so we don't want to ever get in that place, right? Like we want to be a people that are pursuing him. We're never even close to that place because we're on this side of the spectrum. People on this side of the spectrum, nothing to worry about. They're going to grow and they're going to thrive. There's going to be ups and downs. Not always going to be easy, but they're going to grow. They're going to thrive. They're going to produce fruit. And so for my money, I want to be on this end of the spectrum. And my, my question is not, how close can I get to screwing up my life? Right? The question is, I want to thrive. So the question is, what about you? Let's pray. Well, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I just want to give you some time to reflect on this. My brothers and sisters, you're Christ's followers. You've given your life to Christ. Here's my question for you. Is there any area of your life right now you're not thriving? And the reason you're not thriving is because there's a rebellion there. You're resisting God's word to you there. And, and, and you've just not trusted that he knows best or whatever. And so there's, you've just kind of resisted his word. You've resisted the messengers. And it might be in your marriage. It could be in your kids, your personal life. It could be in your sexuality. It could be in your finances. It could be on the job. It could be an integrity issue. It could be a million things. But there's something where you've, you've decided to trust yourself and run after other lovers. You've not truly believed Jesus is the answer to life's most important questions, and so you've rebelled, and as a, life, as a result, your life is a mess, and you, you, can, you can tell it. You know it. It's taken its toll, and if so, hey, I just want to invite you as my brother and sister, just come on home. Just come on back. He's here. His love runs deep, and as you get reconnected in that area, you'll begin to bear fruit. And then for those of you here today, you may not yet be a follower of Jesus. You're just, you're just exploring Jesus. It's, it's maybe all new to you, whatever. But you sense God calling to you today. And there's something in your heart. You're, there's something right now in your heart going on. You want this God. You're hungry for this God. And you want this relationship of experience his love, to experience just a whole new start. You want to be forgiven. You want the power of his spirit in your life. You want to be transformed. You want to live life the way it's meant to be lived, and you want to thrive. And you're ready to bow the knee. You're ready to come home, surrender your life, come under his leadership of your true king. And if that's you, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. And I'm just going to pray a very simple prayer. Nothing magic about the prayer. It's just a way for you to express your heart to God and to cry out to him and to ask him into your life. And so just follow along in your mind, under your breath, your brain, whatever. He will hear and say, dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I want to bear fruit. And I I pray you'd forgive me for all my rebellion, for my sin, for my living life as if you don't exist. And I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me of all that I've done wrong and to give me a whole new future. Thank you that you care more about my future than my past. And I ask you to give me the gift of your spirit come inside of me Teach me how to live and follow you. 
both now and for the next life, that I might thrive. I surrender my life to you. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if that's you today, if you just prayed that prayer, first of all, I want to welcome you to the family, welcome you to the vineyard. And you've just been grafted in. Your relationship with Jesus has just started. And I know it's all new, it's all fresh. You might not know the next steps to take. And what I'd like you to do is do me a favor. In, in a few minutes, we're going to be receiving the morning's offering. And I'd like you to reach inside your program and take a little connect card. Just write a note, Mike, I prayed the prayer. Or I asked Jesus in my life. I gave my life to Jesus, something like that. And, and that will trigger a series of events. I'll write you a letter this week and give you some practical steps, your new relationship, just how to d- d- deepen in that relationship. We'll contact you and just talk about what's happening in your life, talk about baptism, kind of the first step of following. And so just write that there. And so, Lord, today we come. We come as your people, your vineyard. And, God, we just admit that there's many times we have run after other lovers. There's many times we've not believed in your love. There's many times that we have not believed you're the answer. God, we've not believed in our redemption. And so we've missed out. We've not thrived as a result. So today, Lord, we want to turn that around. We want to come back. We want to try to celebrate our redemption, the price you paid as a son to die for us, to make it possible. Celebrate our redemption. We want to say there is no love like your love. We, we want to celebrate that you are the answer to life's deepest questions. So we want to stop running after other gods, people, places, money, travel, careers, things that can never deeply satisfy because you are the one who created us. We're created for you. And you, you, you have to be our deepest love. It's the only place. And so thank you that you are the answer. We, we pray this, that as we come to you now in worship, as we bring your offerings, you'd meet us now in Christ's name. Amen.